Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you on the show. And today, for this episode, we've got Michael Galarnik joining us, joining us from Redmond, Washington. Michael, how are you going? Welcome to the show. Good. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's been a, a long time. What, we've been trying to have this episode for what, four months now. It's crazy. It's, it's been a while, but I mean, also like just the... The online education business is very busy right now, as I'm sure you know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, thank you for your patience. I'm I'm actually super pumped about this episode. We've got a ton of questions um, from our community that have come in through LinkedIn. Well, a good amount of questions that will keep us busy for the episode. And we're talking about jobs. Are you pumped? Oh, yeah. I mean... Jobs are really about how you can apply data science to your, you know, real life and also support yourself, right? You need to eat, yeah. you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for those who are listening, listening carefully, we're going to be discussing how to get hired in data science. But before we get started, Michael, tell us a bit about yourself. Why are you the person to talk with about getting a job in data science? So, um, I'm Michael Galarnik. I'm a machine learning with Python instructor for Stanford's uh, version of adult education. They call it continuing studies. I've also created a couple of courses for UC San Diego's extension school. Uh, so again, like adult education. And those courses at UC San Diego are machine learning fundamentals, data analytics using Python. I've created a couple of courses um, on LinkedIn learning, data visualization with Python or for Python. Uh, and a couple of machine learning ones and data science job courses. So one's like 15 tips to get a data science job, which will be available on LinkedIn Learning. One is a remote version of the same course, uh, focusing specifically on how to get a remote job. And part of the reason why um, I give this advice is oftentimes I aggregate advice from people that are hiring managers or industry leaders, or even um, people that are very famous on social media platforms. So a lot of the advice I give is not just my advice necessarily. It's advice I've aggregated from multiple sources. Mm, absolutely. That's that's the way to go. And man, that is incredible. Like you, uh, <laughs> from uh, what I understand, you're still so young and you've already created so many different courses for me, so many different universities and platform platforms and in addition to having a very interesting background tell us a bit about your background like i can see from linkedin you even worked at nasa as a mechanical engineer that's crazy well it, a mechanical engineering intern and it kind of got extended from there um so i have a really weird background my undergraduate degree is in nano engineering uh so in other words very yeah very very small things nice. and in the course of my uh, undergrad education i kind of realized i liked the programming aspect of what I was doing a lot more than the actual like experimental. So a lot of what I worked on was like micromotors. So things that are 10 and negative six. So things that are like the width of your human hair, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. Motors repelling around like different liquids, um, steering red blood cells via, uh, via ultrasound, like just very, very um, niche kind of projects. and. In my undergrad, I was lucky enough to publish a bunch of papers with a fantastic research group. And then for my master's, I decided I wanted to do something that was probably more um, programming related and something that was more applicable to the job market. Mm. So I've been to the point where I realized I didn't have enough skills for the jobs that I wanted. So I went back to school and got a master's in data science from UC San Diego. Um, and then during that time, I also blogged about data science and a bunch of different things. Wow. Wow, really cool. So, um, yeah, and now, now you're on, on your path to, like, what, what are you focused on right now? You just focus predominantly on teaching uh, data science. Is that correct? Uh, yes, right now. Um, before, I also, um, when I was finished my master's also, like, two years afterward, I worked at Scripps Research Translational Institute. And a lot of what they work on I mean, they, have, they work on a lot of different things, but a lot of what my work on was on was machine learning for wearables and just working with wearable data. So if anyone's ever worn like a Fitbit that has steps, sleep, heart rate, um, I worked on some studies 
with my old boss, uh, Giorgio Creer. Um, I always butcher his last name. <laughs> a lot of it was analyzing long-term trends in sleep, activity, and heart rate. And they're actually doing some work with COVID these days, trying to you know predict early um, outbreaks. So very interesting work. Wow. Wow. Very cool. That's a lot of um, converging technologies, wearables, nano devices. How far are we away on um, data science, of course? How far away are we from ro nano robots uh, traveling in our bloodstream and uh, curing us? I think um, it might not be necessarily nano robots, but uh, things that are manufactured for the uh, nano scale that are actually going to be what people treat. So there's a field called nanomedicine, and a lot of that is about um, using the outside of red blood cells as a coding for medicine. So a lot of traditional like chemotherapy, for example, it's not exactly targeting just the cancer. It lands up, you know, killing a lot of your, you know, healthy cells as well. So a lot of like nanomedicine is about specifically targeting uh, cancer, but also the cancer vasculature or like, you know, um, the places where cancer gets nutrients as well. And I think that's kind of where it's going to be more likely to go. I think the that's actual cool. nanorobots that you steer, I think for mm -hmm. quite a ways away from those ones specifically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, awesome. Are you subscribed to the Data Science Insider? Personally, I love the Data Science Insider. It is something that we created, so I'm biased, but I do get a lot of value out of it. Uh, Data Science Insider, if you don't know, is a free, absolutely free newsletter, which we send out into your inbox every Friday. Very easy to subscribe to. Go to superdatascience.com slash DSI. And what do we put uh, together there? Well, our team goes through the most important updates of the past week or maybe several weeks and finds the news related to data science and artificial intelligence. You can get swamped with all the news, even if you filter it down to just AI and data science. And that's why our team does this work for you. Our team goes through all this news and finds the top five, simply five articles that you will find interesting for your personal and professional growth. Uh, they are then summarized, put into one email, and at a click of a button, you can access them, look through the summaries. You don't even have to go and read the whole article. You can just read the summary and be up to speed with what's going on in the world. And if you're interested in what exactly is happening in detail, then you can click the link and read the original article itself. I do that almost every week myself. I go through the articles and sometimes I find something interesting, I dig into it. So if you'd like to get the updates of the week in your inbox, subscribe to the Data Science Insider absolutely free at superdayscience.com slash DSI. That's superdayscience.com slash DSI. And now let's get back to this amazing episode. Um, okay, so... The way I want to structure this podcast is to um, jump straight into the questions from our audience and then each question will open up like a new topic for discussion and we can dive deeper into it. How does that sound to you? That's fantastic. Awesome. Okay. All right. So we'll post a link to the questions on LinkedIn if anybody wants to see them. That will be in the show notes, but here we go. So um, a question for... Uh, from Deep Dibjot. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. So the question is, I wish to ask what upcoming technologies uh, for a successful, uh, basically what are the upcoming technologies a successful data scientist needs to learn? And also the same question came from Ravi who said, my question is number one, what are the latest machine learning or data science tools, technologies to learn to be competitive in the job market? Good place to start. Michael, what are the best uh, top technologies and tools for data scientists to learn to be competitive? I think it's not necessarily even the latest stuff. It's, you know, learn R or Python. Uh, choose one and learn it really well, then go from there. I think this is very common advice that you hear uh, people like Hadley Wickham and uh, Emily Robinson also say that you just need to learn one tool and go from there. Um, if you try to learn everything, you might be stretched very thin, not be great at any one thing when you first start out. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's my basic advice for tools. Okay. Well, speaking of like um, R Python, 
let's 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 get that one out of the way <laughs> straight up r or python <laughs> which one if i can only learn one which one would it be definitely python i teach a lot of python courses but hear me out on this one uh -huh. so a lot of r is typically at least traditionally uh, very academic so a lot of that is by statisticians by people that typically have a master's or phd um, you're more likely to get jobs that ask for higher educational requirements uh, for jobs that typically use predominantly R. So my advice is learn Python because you can do a lot wider range of tasks with Python, whereas R is, while it's expanding, there's less usage of R in the industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is R more traditionally more like academic? I would love to know the answer for that one. Uh, I think uh, Python's been used uh, for years and years and years before it became a, such a heavy language for machine learning and data science. Mm -hmm. So people use Python for web development, people use Python for just a wide range of applications, whereas R has been typically a statistician's language. So why it could be how R was developed, it could be just traditional usage and what libraries were built off for R. But like anything, these sort of advices that we give on like learn R versus Python, these things change over time, right? If yeah. someone's has, it built a great library, these things can change pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but at this stage, I would agree. I've been noticing how Python is becoming more and more the, the go-to data science tool. So I'll start there. Um, but like more broadly, so somebody is going into data science and um, wh which area of data science would you say uh, or areas are important? Because like, you can't grasp everything right away. And even R versus Python, uh, well, how about uh, visualization tools, Tableau, Power BI, ClickSense, and so on? How about data storage tools like SQL? or maybe even big data tools, Hadoop, um, you know, things like that. So should somebody st go straight for Python and the machine learning things, or should, should they look around and consider other pathways in data science, such as maybe visualization or uh, data pre-processing and, and other, or data storage even, other uh, aspects? What are your thoughts on that? So if you were to ask me, you know, six months ago, my answer would be, uh, quite a bit different than it is now. So uh -huh. my traditional advice has always been look for jobs in your area and see what the job listings are asking for. So uh -huh. look at the jobs and say, oh, is this you know job asking for Power BI or Tableau um, as well as Python or something else? And then based on what the jobs are asking for, you know, learn the tools. And these days with the market as it is being so remote, which is a great thing in a lot of ways, um, it gets a little bit more murky. A lot of jobs still want you to be in person when this ends. So you can also just look at jobs that would be in your area and see what you should learn and then go backward from there. Um, and as far as visualization tools, um, it's great to know, um, like to be able to dashboard in Power BI or Tableau. Um, but the simple answer, I know this is kind of a cop out is again, just look at job listings and see what you should learn. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Okay, interesting. And so then once a person, let's say they identify, okay, I want to do the or the company I want to work for, or I'm interested in, uh, hopefully both in the, the machine learning aspects of data science. So I want to learn Python, uh, as per Michael's advice. And, um, and then there's still in there, there's Okay, there's the traditional algorithms like, uh, I don't know, K-means clustering, KNN, Naive Bayes. Um, there's uh, deep learning, there's ANN, CNNs, RNNs. There's more advanced stuff like um, uh, reinforcement learning, artificial intelligence, and, and different cutting edge and not cutting edge algorithms there. There's also uh, natural language processing and, and things like that. So what, um, where, where, where does one start? So uh, this is, again, probably uh, a very chalk answer. I always recommend the Coursera Machine Learning with Andrew Nguyen. Hopefully I said his name correctly. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of reasons for this. It's a very well-known course. So a lot of the material there is stuff that 
not only is good to learn, but it's also stuff that people get their interview questions from. So it's very much a uh, machine learning one-on-one kind of class. And then from there, you can kind of learn, you know, what you're more interested in and then go from there. And then additionally, once you take that sort of class, you can go to other classes. So one class I really like is on Udemy. It's Python for statistical analysis. Uh, because I find that if you want to go the Cisco route and get a good grasp on like, key values, which are very important for a lot of tech companies for like, A-B testing, that's a great class. I think actually that's one of your classes, right? Um, I, was, I was thinking that. I think it's by Sam Hinton. We cre- like he created it and we helped him uh, popularize the course. So he's an astrophysicist. He's been on the podcast twice now. It's, he, yeah, that class, I love it. I I just out of curiosity watched like the one lecture and I couldn't stop. I watched like three or four in a row. He's got, you know, the guy was on Survivor. Do you know Survivor? <laughs> like, like the TV show when they go onto an I only go on an island and they like, uh-huh. and he was on the Australian version of Survivor and he was like, he cracked up some of the corniest jokes there. Like everybody loved him for his like very, uh, you know, different kind of um, astrophysicist. Uh, personality and it was just so funny and then he brings that to the course I love the guy it's really fun so, yeah, how do you know about the course oh I just I saw the class I, I heard um, I heard of the class on Udemy because as an instructor we typically look for other materials to not only learn from to, but to see where we can get better as instructors mm-hmm. so I found that course because a couple students of mine recommended it mm, that's awesome I'll tell them about this that's so cool as far as other classes, as far as like getting started, once you take the Coursera machine learning, and by the way, for the Coursera machine learning course, I don't necessarily recommend doing the assignments because they're still in Octave or MATLAB, which almost nobody uses in industry these days, relatively speaking, at least. And then from there, if you want to learn Python, there's the Coursera Python for Everybody specialization. If you want to learn about um, like practical knowledge of machine learning algorithms, there's a Udemy, there's a Udemy class called Deep Learning A to Z. Um, if you want to learn that deep class. learning aspect, and then machine learning A to Z is like um, kind of really good as well. No, no way you've taken all of those. Oh, uh, I've taken parts of each class. I haven't gone through any class all the way through these days, uh, just based on the the busy schedule. <laughs> And, and that's the, the way to do it, right? Like um, when you go to a blog, you don't go and read all the blog posts from start to finish that they've ever had. And, and more like that's the way to read self-help books. You don't read the whole thing. You just go and pick and choose what you need. Yeah, exactly. And as far as like books for people starting out, it's the same thing. You don't read the entire pattern recognition and machine learning book by Christopher Bishop. That's like the very good like machine learning theory with, you know, quite a bit of math. Um, you don't just read that as like a, you know, a novel or read, you know, uh, front to back, so to speak. It's yeah, kind of the yeah. same thing with courses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's true. So that, that's a lot of cool resources to get started. What about for someone who's like already quite confident in uh, the basics of uh, data science, machine learning? What are the tools that will help them really um stand out like uh to tools or techniques that in this day and age in 2020 that people should be focusing on well a lot of people want to get into deep learning and that's a good field to get into it's there's quite a bit of a learning curve although that might be changing um so i always recommend why why might that be changing so as you've you know seen and you've read, so there's the deep learning uh, coders with fast AI, and a lot of like fast AI applications. Um, it, fast AI is kind of a wrapper for PyTorch among other things, um, and a lot of the people these days are trying to make deep learning more accessible for people. So trying to make it so you can do um, the case of Jeremy Howard's and Sylvan Guger's book. Guger, not very good with names. I'm butchering everyone's name on the podcast. It's not great, but. <laughs> Um, That's all right. The deep learning for coders um, with fast AI and PyTorch, um, they specifically designed it so someone doesn't have to have a PhD to understand things. And back in the day, uh, if you used early versions of TensorFlow, for example, uh, you had to specify everything and build everything from scratch. And that was very hard to do. 
Um, so these days it's made it a lot easier to, you know, work with Keras and TensorFlow, for example. And Keras and TensorFlow didn't used to be one project either. So for those that are listening, Keras is essentially um, a wrapper for TensorFlow in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Keras can wrap a lot of different things, but um, Keras makes things a lot easier um, to work with for deep learning than TensorFlow on its own. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, gotcha. So, but I was talking more about like, um, what well, should somebody go into the space of computer vision or natural language processing or reinforcement learning? What's the hottest thing right now? I'd recommend more less um, less on what's the hottest thing right now, but what people's interests are in and what their background is. So if you have a background in linguistics, for example, you might want to look into natural language processing because that might be what aligns with your background and interests. Because no matter what you do for a day job, um, you should probably want to enjoy it or have some interest in a lot of what you've done before. Um, and computer vision, again, depends on what you like working with. So if you're, in, you're interested in image recognition tasks and um, those sort of things, then go into computer vision. Because each of these fields are very, very hot. And I know LP seems like it's the hottest thing right now um, based on all the transform models. Um, but again, if it's what you're interested in, go for it. If not, um, I recommend different applications of machine learning. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, I like the idea of finding at least one thing that's hot now that you're interested in and just learning it and doing maybe some projects in it and putting that on your CV or on your LinkedIn or whatever else. Uh, even if the company you're applying for isn't interested in that, or even if, or even if you're not going to be doing that for your job, it just, it just attracts attention. It, it shows the hiring managers, the recruiters that, um, you are interested in being on top of the latest technologies. And then whenever you're, you are in a, uh, employed situation in a role, then you will do the same for whatever you're working on. Absolutely. That's probably the best advice um, that people can have for like looking for jobs, even just, you know, understanding machine learning and deep learning better, or even just any sort of visualization or uh, Python task. It's always the answer to the question, how do you get experience if you need experience to get a job? And if there's an answer to that, the answer is projects, right? And yeah. projects are probably the best substitute for work experience. Um, so if you don't have work experience and the job you're looking at needs two years of experience or five or whatever um, in a specific field, if you have a project that can help lessen the gap um, of experience that you need for a job. Like if you're looking for a job, work on projects. Um, not only are the projects good to put in your resume, but they also in some ways are simulations of case studies, which you often get for um, job tasks. So if you apply for a job and they send you a data set and here, do something with this data set. If you worked on a project before, you can use uh, some of that learning and transfer it over uh, to a case study, for example. That's a that's great advice. And let's move on to that topic. So uh, building a portfolio. We've got a question from Christopher. Uh, who asks, what is the best way to build a portfolio and show you can do the job? So one of the best ways to build a portfolio is, first of all, you have to find a data set or even create your own data set. So the biggest part of building a portfolio, and typically with data science, to do any sort of data science, machine learning, deep learning, you have to have some data set, at least in theory, for most projects. So the first thing is to find a data set. Um, look for something interesting about the data set. So choose some sort of inherently interesting data set. So try to avoid the very typical data sets like, you know, Titanic, Iris, uh, Eminence data set. Um, and sometimes you can look on Kaggle, you can look online, you can scrape data, you can use an API like Twitter. Um, Twitter's not the most interesting data necessarily because a lot of people use it but there's tons of APIs available and tons of things you can do with data. So get the data set and then try to find something interesting to look for in that data set. 
And I think the second part of the question is how to showcase your projects. And there's a lot of different ways. So, I mean, in a lot of ways you can use, you can post things on GitHub, you can write a blog based on uh, your results for your project. And a lot of data science is about communicating results to others and sharing things with other people. So if you write a blog based on your analysis um, from a Kaggle kernel, um, there's a lot of things you can do to showcase your work. One other thing you can do, and this is something that is somewhat controversial, you can also share your work online on uh, Twitter. You can um, post you know, something on Reddit if you really want to, like a link to your work and ask for feedback. Because if you post something online, there's a good chance that someone that's a hiring manager will look at your work. Uh, people online aren't always the nicest necessarily, Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a good chance you'll find someone that's generally helpful and will ask you the same questions or same sort of questions that a hiring manager that, uh, would normally see or ask when they look at your project. And in my experience, it's been very beneficial. Yeah. Give us an example. So when I was applying the scripts, uh, research back in the day, years ago, I was still in school and, um, I used to post a lot of things I would do online. And part of my work at Scripps Research was in some small way, um, communicating results, visualizations. And a lot of the work I did for my blog really ended up helping me in a lot of ways because it showed employers that I could actually do what I said I could do. It's one thing to talk about doing something, another thing to show or to have public proof of it. So um, I had a dashboard um, online, I think of San Diego Hearts. I think this might be still up <laughs> from back in the day, San Diego Hearts. Um, it was for a um, hackathon, and they want to see that you know I could communicate results, visualize data, and then I had some interest in public health because a lot of what I worked on was public health. So I really think it ended up helping me just because um, it showed I can communicate results from a data set, uh, showed I was interested in the topic. And that's also what I look for when I had interns at uh, Scripps Research. It was really nice to see, you know, that they did some programming um, outside their time um, in school or work or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, man, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, I, uh, like, I often see people saying, Oh, it's so hard to get a job in data science. How do you get a job in, in uh, you know, like a field that's so competitive? There are so many people applying and so on. But really, it's one of the hottest professions on earth right now. And one of the most in demand. Of course, there's going to be a lot of supply. Of course, there's going to be a lot of people who want jobs. But if you do what you just said now, like if you take some projects, uh, do the analysis, write out the report, present your findings, all like in a nicely um curated well well structured like medium blog or linkedin blog or on a github page or whatever like you you actually go through the effort and you spend like a few weeks doing that per project and you do like five of those and you use that as your go-to like that should be at the top of your cv or at the top of your linkedin or you should send that to recruiters and so and or hiring managers if people do that you get a job in no time, like seriously, just real fast. You'll be taken like by, you'll have so many applications coming in, uh, your head will start to spin. I've seen that happen. Like even uh, not even in the field, it's not even as hot as data science. This was in, I think it was like around 2013. I was at Deloitte. I went uh, to, uh, I was in um, the data analytics division, but I went to consulting for some projects, the consulting branch of Deloitte. And they, they showed me about, and told me and then showed me that this guy applied for a consulting job, really competitive, like there's, I don't know, 50 applicants per position at uh, Deloitte or something, uh, um, really competitive uh, to get in there. But uh, they showed me this, this one guy really wanted a job in Deloitte consulting. And I think it was like digital consulting. So something to do with like web, um, uh, web uh, projects, consulting and things like that. So what he did was, he set up a website where when you go to that website, like say his first name is surname.com, where you go, when you go to that website, you land on a page that is designed fully with JavaScript 
um, that is a game. So it's like, you know how Google has these Google Doodle games sometimes, if you click on them. So he designed something like that, but like a full, it takes up the whole page and it's, it's him jumping through different uh, challenges. And it, it's like how, how I'm going to, uh, like basically depicts his journey of getting a job at Deloitte and how he's going to add value and how he's going to slay all these monsters and bring a lot of profit. So he made a game about that. And it's very relevant because the job was about digital and, you know, websites and stuff like that. So all he had to do was, he didn't have to send a resume. He didn't have to send a, his LinkedIn. He didn't have to apply for the formal process. All he had to do is send that link of a short message to the, the hiring partner or the hiring director or manager. And it's easy to find their emails. You just take the first name dot the last name in many companies, or, you know, like it's easy to figure out what the email would be. You just send it, sends it to over and says, Hey, like whatever, what I would imagine I would say, like, I'm sorry to uh, get in touch with you directly. I saw this position. I think I'd be perfect. Just uh, have a look at this uh, website I've built for this. And when you go in there and you see this whole thing, a person's put so much effort, it's tailored to this business, to their needs. Uh, it's talking about them. It's talking to the hiring manager directly. Um, like, there's no question about it. Like, why would you spend thousands of dollars, countless number of hours going through interview processes with, with other candidates and seeing the best one when you have one like right here? You just have to do one or two interviews. Boom, he's got the job. So imagine doing that in data science. Like, it, there, there's so many companies that would love to get a person that dedicated. Yeah, it shows that you can do the job before you actually have the job, right? And that's absolutely a beautiful example of like how to really impress people and get a job. Um, it's not to say that people don't get a job, you know, without building portfolio. Um, it's just in the, as the market gets more and more competitive, it helps to really find a way to showcase yourself and stand out. Um, especially now that there's probably been quite a few layoffs with COVID, like more than quite a few. It's for a lot of people, it's very hard to get a job. So in times when there's less jobs, it really helps to do more to showcase your work and showcase yourself as an applicant. Um, okay. One really quick, one really quick thing um, I just want to mention as far as like reaching out to people like hiring managers. Um, a lot of people try to connect and network on LinkedIn, and mm -hmm. there's different ways to ask someone for a referral. And a referral is basically an employee vouching for you um, and recommending you for a job. And one thing I, I see a lot is people ask like a LinkedIn message, like I'm looking for a job and I'd like to know if there's any openings in your department, uh, just to someone random at a company that you're interested in. Um, it's not so much an optimal approach. It could work, um, but people also sort of consider like how the request will be taken by the other person that you ask of. Like, will a generic request want someone to stop what they're doing and respond to you? Um, and in my experience, it typically works a little bit better to first search for job opening at that company of the person you're asking and see if, what the job title is. And because if you're just asking like, oh, I'm looking for a data scientist job and at the company, it's called applied scientist. Uh, it shows you're not really doing as much research before you're asking for a job because it makes the person that you're asking a favor for do some work to be like, oh, are you interested in applied scientist? or this data analyst role, um, rather than, you know, making the person do work, I recommend doing a little work on your end and also say like why you're interested in the role and why you're a good fit for the job, especially. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't waste other people's time because people have such good uh, uh, BS meters. They're going to see the right through it. You, you got to be serious about what you're applying for. Yeah, and and do some research on the company. And this is one thing I didn't used to do. I didn't used to look up, you know, uh, what people typically ask for interviews. So if you go for an interview, for example, uh, look on Glassdoor, see what people have been asked in the past at the big company. Um, also see, like, research the company, like, what metrics are they trying to improve if it's a data science role? Um, what are they trying to showcase? Um, what they typically want in a dashboard if you're doing visualization? Um, basically put some research in before you're looking for a job. And that's a pretty big piece of advice that I wish I knew early on in my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. Um, let's move on to an interesting question about uh, 
education, about learning data science. So uh, Francesco, Francisco, Francisco, or maybe Francesco, uh, asks, my questions are, what advantages do you think a classical education in a physical university has for someone learning data science? And you would be the right person to speak to that because you yourself have a master's degree in data science. And uh, the second part of the question is, what advantages do you think online education has for someone learning data science? And again, you would be great to speak to that because you teach data science online and you've learned online as well. So what are your thoughts on that? So one thing I really like about, I'll get to every part of this question, by the way. One thing I really like about online ed education is it's more modular. You can um, take what specific subjects you're interested in and learn more about those subjects and less about the subjects you're not. And the reason why this is really important is even if you want to learn everything about data science, um, oftentimes when you're working on a project and you need some advice on a project or need to learn more about a specific subject, uh, like for your machine learning A to Z course, if I need to learn more about support vector machines, for example, because I don't know much about them, I can do some research on them. And, and then when I want to learn about something else, I can you know pick and choose parts of your course and go from there. That's something I really, really enjoy. Um, the problem with, uh, online edu education on its own, and this is something that's, you know, being changed quite a bit, um, is a certificate on its own will rarely get you a job. Again, it's all about showcasing yourself, building a portfolio. Um, and the other issue is it's hard to be self-motivated if you just do online courses for quite a few people. Um, so if you're more motivated, um, by things that you have to do, like deadlines and those sort of things. Um, there's some advantage in doing a master's or um, a boot camp, for example. A master's degree is great. However, sometimes the price tag can be uh, quite high and it can take quite a few years to get. And when there's an economic boom, being in school for a couple of years is more difficult because you're sacrificing money in a lot of ways. You can do a part time master's degree or part time, you know undergrad degree, take classes, that sort of thing. Um, and one of the downsides of graduate degrees is they're not always particularly job focused. They're very much on, um, you know, learning theory and well, that's great. I mean, oftentimes you need to get a job and you need money now, right? It's waiting for things is, <laughs> is hard. It's very, very difficult. Additionally, if you're thinking about doing a PhD, um, it's just a lot, a lot of time to dedicate to a PhD. And a PhD can be five years, can be eight years. It could be three in some cases, depending on where you are. So it's a very long period of time where you're not making uh, the kind of income they may need or want in life. Um, I will say one thing about masters and PhDs that I really do like, and even undergrad degrees, is how do you get experience if you need a job to get experience? Goes back to that question. And one really wonderful thing about being a master's undergrad or PhD program is you can intern while you're in the program. And that's one way to build up experience while not necessarily having a full-time job. And whereas when you're in a um, boot camp or if you're doing an online certificate program or just taking a class online, um, a lot of employers are not necessarily open to someone, you know, learning a subject and interning. Because um, the barrier to entry for interns is a lot lower. And at least in the U.S., most of the time for a data science internship, you're getting paid. So it's a way to make money where you're going through. One thing I really like about boot camps, and this has been mentioned by a lot of different people, is there's benefits and drawbacks. One of the biggest benefits of a boot camp is that boot camps have a vested interest in getting you a job. And what is that? Well, it's good for their uh, reporting numbers. If people do well in a boot camp and get a job, then that makes that boot camp look better. So that means that they typically uh, help you with the resume, portfolio building, and they make some effort to connect you with employers. So if they place people at Google, for example, or Facebook or um, any company really, it makes them look better and people are more likely to recommend the bootcamp to, employ uh, to friends or their employers. Um, bootcamps can be a little bit expensive sometimes and time consuming, especially if it's a full-time program. Um, and with anything I'm just talking about it right now, I always recommend people like sit down, research the quality of individual um, courses online, graduate degrees and boot camps, 
because it's not just a master's degree or boot camp. It's which master's degree and which boot camp. Um, so look at alumni that gone through a program. Look at your instructors to see if they've been successful in uh, something that you're interested in. Uh, and that's really, really important. That's really cool. So you got a couple of options, actually, not just online education and university, but you also have boot camps. And um, well, that's kind of like a, a, a faster version compared to universities, right? Uh, absolutely. And boot camps, uh, it used to be back in the day, you need a PhD for a data science role, or at least a lot of people would ask for one. And these days, uh, those requirements are being um, knocked down in a lot of ways. They ask for less of that and just more of, can you do the job? Do you have the skills? And a boot camp, typically, um, a good boot camp at least, provides the skills to do a job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, so there we go. That's the answer to that question. And um, another interesting one. So I really believe in uh, teaching as a way of learning something even better. And it's, I'm very excited to see that Fahad asked a question, um, which is the following. If someone would like to teach data science to a younger generation like school students, how can someone prepare the materials? Or in which way can he approach them, he or she? Well, in which, uh, in which way can pretty much anyone, I guess he's asking for himself, but uh, anyone approach them? So one of the biggest things is the age group. So this advice is, could be completely invalid for um, older generations of uh, people, like people that are you know in their 20s now versus 16 versus 12 versus 8. So for the younger crowd, you might want to first, you know, lay off the Python and learn um, Scratch or I forget what people typically end up doing that, like uh, programming Minecraft, for example, just get people into programming, necessarily, not necessarily data science or machine learning when they're really, really young. And then also, uh, this goes with an older audience too. Uh, tell people about the application of what you'll be learning other than just the theory. So rather than, you know, these are multiplication tables. Uh, tell people what they can do with multiplication, for example. Uh, same thing goes for data science. So why are we learning about linear algebra? Um, how does this relate to you know, the world at large if we're teaching linear algebra to college students, for example? Uh, teach them about you know, um, how eigenvectors and eigenvalues are used in real life. Um, if you're interested in dimensionality reduction um, later on, that's actually a terrible uh, subject to talk about. But talk about how uh, concepts relate to real things. And that's probably the most important part is the application and the intuitive knowledge of how something works than necessarily like here's the hard and fast math because you lose a lot of students that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. Very interesting. And so how do you go about preparing materials for your courses? Very time consuming. <laughs> I'm sure you know for your own courses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there is, it goes also with blogs. There was a, a Medium blog ages ago written by people from Medium about like which blogs are the most popular and most, you know, well looked at. And for blogs, for example, a lot of it's just how much effort you put into them. Like how many hours do you dedicate to a blog, for example? It's the same thing for a course, for example. Uh, the courses that tend to do better are ones that people put more time into. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, oftentimes for... A course, it's material that I either struggled on or material that my students asked me for. And that's more common these days. If a student asked me, like, you know, hey, I'm not understanding box plots, for example. Um, and let's say 20 students have the same issue. Then I find out what they're having issues with and then work my way backward and write a like material on that or write a, a script for a video and do that sort of thing. Um, I should also note that if you're interested in teaching data science, um, oftentimes writing tutorials is actually a good way to build a portfolio as like a data science instructor or Python instructor or R instructor. Um, like the way that I got in touch with this podcast, for example, is my friend John David uh, got me in touch with you. And the way John David knows me is because of people from Maycraft, um, who I work with for LinkedIn Learning, they saw one of my blogs online, uh, asked me to make a LinkedIn learning class, 
that's how I met John David and that's how I met you. So, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool story. Yeah. So it, it really does help to write tutorials or make YouTube videos or whatever. Even if they're not perfect, I have terrible YouTube videos online uh, for when I was first starting. Mm. And they actually did help me in a lot of ways become better at teaching. So also if you're interested in teaching, um, I advise start making content and you'll learn from your experiences and make your content even better. So I think the biggest thing is to just to start doing something and then figure out what you're doing good and bad along the way. Mm -hmm. For many people, um, the hurdle to st just starting doing something is um, the like fear of imposter syndrome and like fear of uh, not um, being not knowing enough or being an expert. And, and we've spoken a lot about that on the podcast uh, before with other guests. What I want to ask you is for many other people, the, the roadblock for just doing it is like, you know, this feeling of like, I can't be bothered or like, it's oh, so much effort. I, 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 it's just, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, how, did, how did you overcome that? Well, uh, it's at least for me, it was first about accepting that I won't know everything. And mm -hmm. there's always been subjects I don't know. And as an instructor, that's, you know, hard to tell your students like, oh, I just don't know that. You know, I don't know that advanced, you know, um, topic or I can't derive kernel PCA for you on the spot, you know. Um, and it's about accepting you don't know everything. And for students that are just starting, I always recommend, you know, you don't have to dive all the way in something. When you first start, you can do 20 minutes a day or an hour a day um, and pick, you know, one course to learn from or one project to work on. And there's a lot of um, being overwhelmed because learning everything in data science would be very, very overwhelming. So pick one specific thing, learn Python, learn R, um, you know, focus on learning, you know, one model um, for machine learning or like one BI tool, you know, if you want to learn uh, day visualization and you want to use a BI tool, uh, start just learning Power BI or start just learning Tableau. And then once you kind of feel okay with that or you don't want to do it anymore, uh, learn something else. Yeah, so one step at a time, right? Yeah, like, always one step at a time. <laughs> Biggest advice that you can give people is just yeah. start somewhere and... Otherwise it looks too big, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, you probably have like uh, I have this feeling. Tell me if you have the same. Like if I looked back, like oh the I don't know the journey I had in the past five years, and I was to ta like I was to know this whole journey five years ago, I would have been so scared. I might have not just gone ahead with it. But when you break it down to little steps, it's much much uh, more appealing and it's, it looks doable. Exactly. Um... There, there's no way um, I could have done what I've done if I just saw everything. I was like, oh, I'm going to do all that. Uh, that seems impossible. Uh, <laughs> and also, you don't always know where your journey is going to take you, right? Like, I don't think you thought you would have, like, a massively popular podcast um, or that your classes would be, you know, so popular on a lot of different platforms, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, uh, it's just, just baby steps for sure. Um, one more question we've got that I want to really want to cover off before we wrap up. And that is from Francesco again, who says, what do you think are the necessary soft skills to be a, a successful data scientist? So uh, you're asking someone who doesn't have perfect soft skills here. So I think one of the <laughs> biggest things <laughs> is... Um, Communication, and that's kind of a cop-out answer again, um, but learning to listen to, to people, find out what they want, and also find out how to best communicate results to people. And a lot of like data science is listening to people, listening to stakeholders, find out what the problem is, identify that, and then you know try to find a way to a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that um, I've learned more of is to listen to people about what exactly they're asking for. And also to ask, mm -hmm. you know, clarifying questions on to narrow down exactly what they're looking for. So communication is a big one. Um, 
also, you know, just don't be too difficult to work with. And mm -hmm. the, the more skilled you are, you can be probably not as great with the soft skills. Um, but a lot of who you, when you interview, often as people are looking for, can I work with this person? Is this person, you know, could be painful to work with? So, you know, <laughs> uh, likability and um, just not necessarily be easygoing, but just listen and learn to communicate better of your results. <laughs> That's good. Like empathy. <laughs> Up, up level your uh, level up your empathy right so i have a question for you so what are the sure. best uh soft skills um uh, in your life as a data scientist gosh um best soft skill i, I would say two one asking learning uh or understanding how to ask the right questions a lot of the time people don't really know what they want. So when somebody asks you for a data science project, um, it's a whole art in its own to go and clarify what exactly is it, not just what they want, what is it that they need? So you need to deliver to people's, not just wants, but also uncover their their needs as well. And there's a lot of, a lot of communication that is explicit. There's also a lot of implicit communication or a lot of things that on the onset of the project that might be assumptions they're making that you need to uh, dive in and uh, understand, hey, that's not really a fact, that's an assumption. So at the onset of the data science project, absolutely important to do that because otherwise you might be doing the whole, whole wrong project. In fact, I'll fix that. Like I'll, I'll correct it. Not two, but three things. So that's the first one. Second one is throughout the project, another important soft skill is to constantly communicate your progress and check up with uh, the stakeholders to make sure they're happy with your progress. Because if you just leave it until the very end, let's say it's a six week project, and then on like week five, you tell you show them, hey, this is my result that I'm gonna present to you in a week. And they're, they're like, well, hold on, that's not what we wanted. Boom, you're in trouble. You have one week to fix a five week project. Whereas if you communicate with them with them from the start, you go and sit with them, you you watch them do their job, or you you walk around with them on the factory floor or whatever it is you're working on, um, and you constantly update them on the results, you build you turn them into an advocate, and that way they are going to now at the end of the six weeks they don't have a choice but to be on your side when together you and them are presenting to their boss to the upper management, to the final client or so on. So um, create yourself an ally along the way and also avoid any, um, you know, any wrong turns in the project. And then the final third part of um, um, what's it called? Soft skills and data science, perhaps, or oh, maybe like one of, well, they're all important, but this one, this one is the one that will really turn you into a rock star in demand data scientist that, um, is uh, everybody's after like headhunters are calling, recruiters are emailing, and this one is presentation. the The art of standing in front of an audience, whether it's twelve executives or two hundred uh, people in a um, in a big hall, and having your slides up there, you can do the whole project right. You can do all the steps right, but if your presentation style and skill is not engaging, is not fun your delivery will be dry and people are not going to be hooked. The thing is, humans are not just robots. And even if you give a human the best uh, possible advice, if it's just pure logic, in most cases, they won't take it. There's tons of books on psychology written about this. Humans make decisions based on emotions, not on logic. They later justify the decision to themselves with logic. But they make an emotion. How many times have we, like, has anyone listening to this been to a store, you get super hyped about something, you buy it, and then you come home and you're like, why did I buy that? Because you can't justify it with, with logic. There is no logic behind it. You bought it based on emotion. And so same thing with presentations. You need to present. You, you did all this um, work, and data science is like pure logic, pure data, pure mathematics, and uh, analytics, and um, logic in a way. So you did all of that, but now you have to switch your brain. You have to like completely shift into the emotional domain. You have to present it 
from an emotional standpoint, you have to convince the decision makers to act on your insights from an emotional standpoint. Um, and then if they ever want that justification or, or confidence, you have the data behind. But you should put that aside and you should turn it into a fun, engaging uh, presentation. And that's a, that's a whole, that's like acting, you know, that's a whole acting um, part that you have to augment your data science career with. And only if you have that, then will you be one of the top 1% of the data scientists in the world that, that really not only can deliver the results, but like do the math or calculations and um, data analysis, but can actually move the needle, make their company go forward. And, and that's uh, ultimately how you're going to be measured and you're, or how people are going to see that you're making a difference, not by the, the, the analytics that you do, but by the uh, decisions and actions that are driven by your analytics. So that would be my take on soft skills. That is a fantastic answer. And I'm glad you gave that. Because, <laughs> yeah, you have to be able Thanks. to, you know, you do all the hard work of the analyzing, the, the, the long nights, the early mornings, in some cases, of doing all the manipulation, uh, some cases, machine learning, visualization. And if you can't present your results, it might be the best model in the world. But if it doesn't provide value, people understand the value, then it's almost useless in a lot of cases. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. Well, Michael, this is a good uh, part for us to wrap up on. I would like to thank you for coming uh, on the show and sharing your insights. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to find this useful, especially those starting out into the space of data science. Before I let you go, please, could you tell us where people can find you, follow you or get in touch? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Glarnic Michael. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, send a message request. Uh, you can find my blog on Medium. I think it's also probably Glarnic Michael. Uh, you can take any of my LinkedIn learning classes. Um, any way you want to contact me, feel free to. And I'm looking forward to hearing from people, hopefully. Awesome. Awesome. So we'll definitely share all those links in the show notes. And Michael, one more question. What's uh, a book that you can recommend to our listeners? Something, some book that's changed your life? Well, I'll start with the, the machine learning aspect of it. Uh, Python machine, uh, machine Learning by Sebastian Rushka. I hopefully I said the name correctly. Uh, I really like the book just in terms of just content in general. I think it's just a really well thought out book and the author put a lot of time into it. And as far as like non-data science books, uh, I really liked The Name of the Wind um, by Patrick Rothfuss when he wrote it back in the day. I'm not sure he's actually coming out with the third novel. Uh, it's a fiction mm -hmm. book, uh, but I really sometimes like listening to audiobooks when I'm either working out or on a plane ride or driving or whatever. Um, but yeah, those are my books. Uh, there's many more. Fantastic. What's, more the, curious. <laughs> what's the second one called again? The Name of the Wind. The Name of the Wind. Interesting. Is it, is it like... Uh... What kind of fiction is it? Uh, you know, young boy goes to school. Uh, you know, family gets killed, but like, you know, tries to make the best of it. <laughs> so, like modern times, not like futuristic. No, no, no like uh, like fantasy. You know, heroic fantasy. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, the the problem with the book, and this is kind of a double edged sword, is the third book's not out. The second book in the series oh. released in twenty eleven, and it's twenty twenty uh -huh. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so with any series, I usually recommend waiting till it's you know done because you never know if the author doesn't you know is not interested anymore in the book or busy or you know, whatever. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Awesome. Well, Michael, amazing. Thank you so much again for coming to the show. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thanks for your time. So there you have it, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this podcast and got some valuable takeaways from here and. Got some clarity on what the next steps are for your career. Some of the things that we spoke about might sound like common sense, like very straightforward, but when put together and executed on properly, this is how you get the top jobs, top paying, most exciting, uh, most uh, uh, open jobs for career growth, for 
learning the best jobs on the market, you need to execute uh, these steps in co- combination. My personal favorite part uh, uh, from this podcast was when uh, Michael talked about the difference between traditional education versus online education. Uh, he said there that online education has this property of being modular, so you can pick out what you want and in the traditional education you actually can't you have to go through the semester semesters or years in a sequential order and just yes you can maybe sometimes pick subjects but often they're already selected for you and you just have to do them even if it might not be extremely relevant to you so i i had never thought of it that way before and that shows another advantage of online education um, and there were some questions uh, that we necessarily didn't like uh, get to or Uh, I didn't read out specifically in the questions that were submitted on LinkedIn because we covered them off in the conversation. But some people are asking, like, how do you get a job without a a formal education? Well, you don't really need formal education. You can get away with online education or get away with, you can actually excel with online education in the space. And also like what Michael mentioned about boot camps as another alternative. So if you're, if you're like online education is just not enough for you, you're finding it hard to um, be motivated then boot camp you don't really have to go for a full degree at a traditional university you can if, if that's what you want but also remember there's a another option called um, boot camps which are perhaps shorter than the full degrees which sometimes can take years but at the same time they're more uh, involved and will <laughs> will uh, force you to continue and be more and motivate you Uh, a bit more than just online courses so there we go that's the breakdown and as always you can get uh, the show notes for this episode at superdatascience.com slash 401 that's superdatascience.com 401 woohoo we're (laughs) past the 400 mark and um, there you'll find the transcript for the episodes any materials we mentioned plus urls to michael's linkedin Uh, Twitter, and so on. So make sure to connect and follow Michael, see what he gets up to. And uh, one final thing, if you know anybody who's just starting out into data science and you think they need some clarity, some, uh, they might be a bit lost in all the things that are going on in this space, uh, send them this episode. It's really easy to share. Just send them the link, superdatascience.com slash 401. And uh, thanks again for being here. I'll see you next time. Until then, happy analyzing.